Jessica Donegan and welcome to another episode of Workshopped It. It's a series where I take a published book, we discuss what I liked about it, and some elements that could just be tweaked a little bit to bring it to the next level. This particular episode is going to discuss Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo. It is her first new adult book, although she has quite a few successful young adult books. And I was excited to get my hands on this book. It was published earlier last year. I personally couldn't find the book budget to buy it and I couldn't get to my library to pick it up. So when it came up on Kindle Unlimited earlier this year, I knew I was going to scoop it up and read it right away. It's not available on Kindle Unlimited anymore. I would totally recommend this book if you can find it at your library. I don't know that it's worth its current selling price though. Um, it's going to depend from person to person on that. And I hope you guys stick with me and listen to what I have to say and see if it is worthwhile or not based off of some factors for you. Now, Ninth House is a dark urban fantasy story and it's primarily mystery based. So we, we enjoy quite a bit of like that dark gritty um, hard-boiled persona in Alex Sturm. She's our lead character and she has a dark past and there's a lot of dark things going on. In fact, a uh, trigger warning for anyone who might be sensitive to themes of drug abuse, sexual assault, rape, self-harm, uh, grooming of a minor, just off the top of my head, probably quite a few others as well. The book is pretty dark that way. If you're not up for that kind of discussion, I would suggest finding another video to watch. It's totally okay, but I am going to end up discussing some of those elements in detail. Just because we have to, they're so serious, we have to talk about whether or not they were used to their fullest, whether or not they were used just to cause controversy, and, you know, whether or not we felt they were appropriate in the book. So we will be discussing them a little bit. Um, when we get to them. Other than that, the book overall has very mixed ratings. When I was reading it, I loved every second. I was drawn in right away from the beginning and I just kept going. If I had rated it right after I had read it, it would be a five star review. But I don't rate books right after I review them. Mostly because I like to keep thinking about them and turning them over in my mind and evaluating different parts of them. So for me, after about a few weeks reflections, I realized it was closer to a three-star review. Um, I ended up giving it four stars, mostly because I did read it so quickly, and I did enjoy the process of reading it so much, even though upon reflection I thought maybe not as good as I thought it was. My first impression was just right out of the gate enjoyment. So I gave it a four star, and I do recommend that you check it out. If you haven't read the book, I would go ahead and stop this video if you haven't read the book and you want to read the book. I would go ahead and pause the video right here, pick it up at your library, go ahead and buy it on Amazon, and come back to me afterwards to see if you agree with what I have to say or not. Um, but if you have read the book, and I think a lot of you might have, then come on and join me on this. A quick summary from Amazon on this book, just so that we're all on the same, starting on the same place, is going to be Galaxy, Alex, Stern is the most unlikely member of Yale's freshman class. Raised in Los Angeles hinterlands by a hippie mom, Alex dropped out of school early into a world of shady drug dealer boyfriends, dead-end jobs, and much, much worse. In fact, by age 20, she is the sole survivor of a horrific, unsolved multiple homicide. Some may say she's thrown her life away, but at her hospital bed, Alex has offered a second chance to attend one of the world's most prestigious universities on a full ride. What's the catch? And why her? Still researching for answers, Alex arrives in New, Haven's, in New Haven, tasked by her mysterious benefactors while monitoring the activities of Yale's secret society. Their eight windowless tombs are well-known haunts of the rich and powerful, from high-ranking politicos to Wall Street's biggest players but their occult activities are more sinister and more extraordinary than any paranoid imagination might conceive. They tamper with forbidden magic, they raise the dead, and sometimes they prey on the living. So I don't actually think this summary does a good job 
talking about what's in Ninth House. And if I hadn't seen so many reviews, I probably wouldn't have picked the book up off of that review. The cover is a nice cover, but it's also mostly text. So I probably wouldn't have picked the book up just off of the cover either. But it does have a lot of reviews, and I knew going in that it was going to be dark and gritty. I knew that I was going to have kind of a hard-boiled character in Alex, and I knew it was going to have a female lead. So I was really excited for those elements. Okay, so going forward with this, there are going to be major spoilers within this episode. So if you haven't seen Ninth House, and if you haven't read Ninth House, and you don't want to be spoiled, I will go ahead and stop here. For everyone else who's staying with me, welcome. This is not going to be a chapter by chapter breakdown of Ninth House because it's very well written. The lead character and the main supporting character are pretty well rounded, are feel like fully fledged people. So I don't have a lot of step by step, chapter by chapter notes to give in that regard. I do have some larger structural issues. We are going to start with structure. The story is told out of sequence and it's told in a split perspective between Alex, our lead, and Darlington, our supporting male role. Let's start with the out of sequence part. The whole story is a mystery, and part of the mystery comes from how the story is told, which is this out of sequence. If you had if we had read the story from the very beginning where Alex is in high school and dealing with her ability to see ghosts all the way through the end of her first year in college, there wouldn't have been so many questions. A lot of things would have been answered because we had full context of her past history. We had learned with her how her abilities work and why she's afraid of the, afraid of being able to see ghosts and why she doesn't think it's such a great thing and she doesn't understand why so many people like the fact or are jealous of her because she can see ghosts. Um, I don't think though, even though it helps with the mystery, that overall telling this story out of sequence makes a lot of sense. There are parts that I would hold back. I wouldn't start at the very beginning where Alex is in high school, where I would have started this story is when Alex is waking up in the hospital and is offered an opportunity to go to Yale. I think that creates a lot of tension still. Our main character has just been through something deeply traumatic. She's the only survivor in a brutal homicide, a brutal multiple person homicide. They don't know how she's alive. They don't know who attacked and killed her or attacked and killed all the people around her. And they've cleared her because the attack was so physically demanding and brutal, no one can imagine that Alex is capable of doing it. She doesn't have the strength and she couldn't have used the surrounding tools, especially with the level of drugs that they found in her system. She's just not cap she wouldn't have been coherent and she wouldn't have been strong enough to manage all attacking and killing that many people. So, you know, that gives us an interesting mystery with Alex. Uh, if she cared at all about any of the people she was around, it gives us a lot of sympathy for her. Um, and it makes us wonder more about Alex. So we're on her, if we start there, we can be on her side right away and also be really interested in her. So that's where I would start the story. And I would tell the whole story in a linear way from there. I think there's enough going on that's interesting and that's um, asking for our attention without telling it fall and then flashing back to spring and then flashing over to the winter. I just didn't, I don't think long term it served the narrative well. And sometimes when I was reading it, I would skip portions and come back so I could enjoy the story in a linear way. Um, that's just my thought, my take on it. You can still have some flashbacks. I would leave in certain flashbacks, like where Alex is starting to find her way. There's a death of a townie on Yale College campus, and Alex has to be there because part of her job is to keep all of the different magical houses in line in Yale. 
and they suspect at first that this might have a magical, a magical origin. And when she gets there, they tell her, hey, we know that the magical people didn't do this, it's not a big deal, it's a town girl, local cops are going to take it over, don't worry about it. And at first Alex is relieved because she's really overwhelmed and she doesn't want to have to deal with this if she doesn't have to. But we have a flashback to her friend who was murdered in this scene, who was murdered back here when she was in the drug den. And she realizes that the townie is not going to get the kind of attention that they need. And in the same way her friend didn't get the kind of attention that they need and her friend didn't get justice and this girl isn't going to get justice and she creates a link between the two of them that drives her to continue to pursue this murder even though it's no longer part of her obligation and in fact people would prefer she leave it alone. So I think having that kind of flashback where we see her and her dead friend bonding and maybe we see elements of how her friend was murdered uh, really help drive the story. So those kind of flashbacks I would leave in, but I wouldn't jump time. I would just tell the whole thing in sequence. The other thing that telling the story in sequence would help us with is Alex's character changes a lot from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. There's a huge character growth and she starts out being cagey and a little unsure of herself. And she becomes more confident. Um, she becomes tougher in some senses, but she also opens up more to some of the characters around her. I just think the story would have made more sense if we had seen that happening in a linear way instead of jumping from one point to another point to another point where she was in different different processes where we didn't get a full arc. I like I like the arc there and I would have enjoyed seeing it more in a graph line way instead of different like random plot points. So that's one major change I would make. The split perspective between Alex and Darlington works. I like Alex's perspective a lot more than Darlington's. We get a lot of background information about Darlington and him growing up in Yale and living with his grandfather and his parents being kind of abusive. Well, not kind of abusive. His parents were neglectful for sure. And that part of the story is really interesting hearing about how Darlington grew up. But most of what Darlington has to say is not very interesting. And a lot of times I would have preferred to get Alex's perspective to Darlington's. So I'm not sure what I would recommend workshop-wise for that. I don't know if it makes sense to tell the story entirely from Alex's point of view. There's a lot of things Alex doesn't know that Darlington tells us. But in that way, I feel like Darlington is a bit of a crutch for Lee Bardugo, the author. Like, couldn't she have gotten Alex where she needed to go without using Darlington's perspective? Wouldn't that have been more interesting for us to learn this information with Alex? Or for us not to know like Alex, to have the same kind of fear or concern that Alex has? We would have empathized more with her. And I think some people had trouble empathizing with Alex, so getting that extra element where we are in the same position as her might have helped with that. I don't know what I would do with that. I guess leaving it as is is fine. I probably would have recommended if I had been workshopping this with the author at the time trying to tell it all from Alex's point of view and maybe finding a way for Darlington to give that information to Alex because Darlington and Alex start to bond as time goes on and it doesn't to me make a lot of sense why Alex starts to like Darlington. Like, if I had been her in her situation, I would have liked Darlington. Me and him would have never gotten along. And I know I'm not her. She has strong personality traits that are different than me. But those personality traits don't lend themselves to her making friends with Darlington. So that part, or looking up to Darlington, or whatever you want to call their relationship, I, it just didn't make sense to me. I understood her loyalty to the man at the end, but I didn't understand her liking of him. I didn't get that at all, or her ability to forgive him certain things, or even, yeah, I just didn't understand their relationship, and a lot of times I didn't find Darlington very relatable or interesting either. So less of him would have been an improvement for me. 
Another element we have to discuss is the school setting. I really liked Yale as a setting. I thought that having all of the buildings described and the layout gave a strong sense of place, made us feel like we were really at Yale, and helped give more credence to some of the supernatural elements that we got involved with later. However, I don't love a character going to school. I think some of this has to do with how many young adult stories I read both as a young adult and early 20s. I'm just tired of characters going to school, being in school, hearing about class periods and class papers and, and class drama. And really, Alex going to classes didn't seem to play into this story a lot. It is number one in a series, so maybe later in the series it will be more important. But right now, her going to classes, it was another hurdle for her. She was struggling with school, partly because she never finished high school, partly because she was out of practice. Going to classes, um, the whole nine yards. But I just don't understand why they enrolled her in Yale at all. Why don't they just employ her as like a watcher of these societies? You would think that her ability to see greys, as they call them, but are ghosts, would be valuable, would be so valuable, it would go beyond just three years in school. And the whole reason the position is a three, four year position in school in the Yale University is because they have to take this potion to see grays and the potion is hard on a person's system. So you can only hold that position and take that potion for three or four years without risking permanent damage. But since Alex doesn't have that capability, doesn't have that limitation, why wouldn't you just employ her and pay her and set her up someplace because you're going to want her for the whole time and then Darlington could train her she could train the next person it could always be a two-person team it would make sense to have someone who continued that experience who continued taking notes and research you know you could train all those things on her and you know if your issue is her lack of academic prowess you could have her be a part-time student take a couple classes at a time really I just don't think the whole structure made sense. I don't understand why they made her be a full-time student. I don't understand why we had that part of the story. For me, the classes part was the least interesting part. It ties in a little bit to the end of the story. I don't, I don't want to give the end entirely away, so I won't talk about it too much. But I thought those elements we could have done another way. Uh, we still could have had this surprise twist ending without having her be a full-time student. I think too part of the reason we did that is because we wanted Alex to have two girlfriends who are like normal people. Those two girlfriends didn't add anything to the story as far as I'm concerned. Nothing at all. They were really vapid and annoying. I didn't like them. I didn't like hearing about the dorm layout. Ugh. I skipped a lot of them. I just didn't like them. So we could have got rid of that entirely. And two, a uh, major trigger warning coming up right now, but I think the reason these two girls are in the story is because all three of the girls like to go out and party on the weekends. And one time Alex can't go out with them because she has to do her supernatural job. And she comes back and she finds out that her friend was drugged by like a magic drug and essentially raped and someone filmed it. And I understand why she wanted to put something like, why Lee Bardugo wanted to put something like this in the book because assault on college campuses is a huge deal and recording it and forcing a victim to live that over and over again and have other people view it is also very traumatizing and is a big issue, a big hot button issue that we would all probably like to talk about more and find more solutions to. But it's not handled well in this book. There's her, there's the girl this happened to crying and just being overwrought, which makes sense. And then the next day she's fine, and next 
she's fine because Alex is able to get a hold of the video and stop it from circulating out. And apparently that makes everything better. I don't know how that made everything better, but it did because now the girl is going to classes and acting like nothing happened. And by next week, she wants to go out to another party again. And that's just... I don't buy any of that. It's handled so flippantly. I don't understand. I don't understand why it was in there because it wasn't handled with the kind of weight that it needed to be handled with. And I don't think the story had time to address it either. I really think there's so much going on in this story and this piece is not related to anything else that's going on. It, it's vaguely related because the magic drug is only supposed to be available by this one house and it turns out that someone found a way to grow the magic drug and that's how this gross dude got a hold of it and is now drugging girls on campus and raping them. So in that way it, it connected back but it didn't connect back enough. We didn't need that. Um, we could have found out about this magic drug being grown on campus a whole bunch of different a whole bunch of other ways um, maybe one of the people from the group that's supposed to have tight control of the magic drug found the guy peddling it on the side. Um, or maybe Alex finds out about it in the greenhouse. Maybe, um, if she had a friend who was into botany, or perhaps the research girl who is in the house, um, goes on gets a hot tip and she goes and she finds it. There's a lot of ways we could have found out about this drug without a graphic rape video recording scene. And since we don't deal with the fallout, it feels convenient. And I have to say this is probably the one element to me of this story, the dark element of this story, that didn't make any sense. I understood why Alex turned to drugs. I understood more or less why we had some grooming and some earlier assault and rape scenes. All of that uh, I felt was building towards something. I felt the character was impacted in a way where what happened to them made sense. It wasn't just a graphic use of something dark and gritty for the sake of being dark and gritty. But here I feel like we just took something that was topical, that people were talking about, that we knew would generate interest and threw it in there, and then we never dealt with it. So I didn't care for that particular scene, and I didn't care for how it was handled, and I didn't care for those two college girls at all, because I really don't know what they were doing for the story. For me, it would be better if Alex just got hired on and took was obligated to take a class or two so that eventually she could have the education she needed. But I mean, really, at this point, they need Alex more to patrol the houses when they're doing magical works. So instead of focus making her do dual focuses when you know she doesn't have the background um, history to allow her to do this well, make her focus on the thing that's most important. Make her focus on the supernatural and learning that. When she's got a handle on those parts, then you go ahead and have her do the regular academic stuff. And by the time you're done in a couple of years, you're going to have someone who is full-time in that role, who can always continually be helping your new recru new recruits, who you don't have to worry about poisoning accidentally with the potion of sea grays, and who also has all of the both experience and the background classwork or classical training, whatever you want to call it, to do it. And I think for someone who's all these people are so smart, they're the elite of the elite, and they get all these hot tips or whatever that help them promote them up the ladder and make them the best, why would they not know how to do this? That part to me didn't make a lot of sense and I found pretty frustrating. So I would change that up. Okay, and then the last thing I would say is that the ending slash last third of the book feels less than satisfying. The front of the book and the middle of the book are really strong. And I think what's happening story-wise makes a lot of sense and goes really well. If I were 
writing the story or helping edit the story, I probably would have stopped after we solve the girl's murder. Um, the double cross, double cross that happens at the end feels, the whole story feels really elongated. It feels like it just keeps going on for no reason, I guess, to fill out a word count. And I don't, I don't like what happens at the end. I was really enjoying the story and I thought the ending, one of the characters is a female guidance counselor. And I thought maybe we were going to find out that she could see ghosts too and she was going to help Alex get a handle on things. And that would have been interesting to have someone outside of the magic house system apparently be knowledgeable on it and help Alex out. But instead, she can see ghosts, but she is evil and Alex has to off her. And I don't really care for that. Um, especially since we also found out that the headmaster, the headmaster of the patrol agency is also evil and also had set Alex up to fail. It's just, I know you're not supposed to use this word, or I know people don't like when you use this word, but it's really problematic because Alex is minimally biracial when everyone else seems to be white. So the fact that we have a white guy setting up a biracial woman to take the fall for something is icky. Uh, it's... I don't know how else to say it. It's icky. It, it was uncomfortable too because Alex is the only person who seems to have natural magic abilities and she's also the only person who is obviously not white. So it feels like a magical minority. And I mean, I don't 100% know how you balance that because I love the fact that Alex is not white and that we're getting some of that, <laughs> that we don't use that all by itself, like as an explanation, like she just is a character that happens not to be white and I enjoy that. And she is a character that doesn't have the same experiences as other people. And even if she was white because she has this drug past and she dropped out of high school when she was 16 and she lived on the streets, nobody else in this story has a past like that. They're all pretty privileged. They, most of them weren't wondering where their next meal was coming from. And it turns out that Darlington had it's a surprise reveal that Darlington also had a difficult past. Um, although difficult in a way that's completely different than Alex. So I like all those parts about Alex. I like that she is mixed race. I like that we get a little, like, the briefest hint of that besides them stating that she's mixed race. But I don't like that she is I don't like some of the tropey implications that happen because of that. And I'm not 100% sure how to change it. I don't know if the best thing for you to do is just to have a more diverse cast. Like, you can't be all white people, so maybe just put some non-white people in there, you know? Or maybe the thing to do is to change this back part. Like, it made sense for that one dude to be really aggressive. And it made sense um, that he wasn't smart enough to do that on his own, that someone else was using him as a fall guy the same way they intended to use Alex. But maybe just change who that person is, you know? Um, I don't think the headmaster, the headmaster guy has that much to gain from being the evil dude. It could have been any alumni from these houses or it could have been one of the houses that wanted one of the one of the magical societies that used to be a house and was kicked off away from their house it could have been them too it could have been a group of people and that could have helped also a group of people who are looking to regain house status it just seems more interesting to me than what we got it seems to make more sense and it seems more interesting so the back third, I would change up the plot twists 
Um, you know, really since in my version, Alex wouldn't be going to school, we wouldn't have a female guidance counselor there. And I think getting rid of that whole arc makes sense, really. I don't like any of that arc. I think it was toxic in a lot of ways. And I don't want to necessarily delve into all the ways it was toxic, but we could do without it. I know we're setting up for a second book in the series. This isn't a standalone story. But there's enough going on since we find out that Darlington is missing and Alex is going to go get him back. We don't need any of the back third, actually, for that. I'll, I'll, that as a second book works all on its own. And we don't even need the headmaster dude to be evil because Alex and him and a couple of other people work together on a ritual to try and get him out. And he can't. And he says he can't do it for, I don't know, some reason. But basically he's given up on Darlington. And if the headmaster dude has given up on Darlington and has sort of been dismissive of Alex because it's her first year, and you know, she doesn't come from a great background, and she doesn't have the same sort of academic rigorous training that other people usually do, and she's struggling in a lot of ways, which is making, because she's being pulled so many different ways, it's making her come off as incompetent, even though that's not necessarily the case. She's just overwhelmed. Um, you know, he's given up. He doesn't really take anything Alex has to say or think at face value or even give it a lot of consideration. So he's out of the picture too. Even if he ends up being a cool supportive dude in the next book, she would still have to work on her own. So I think the stuff that Bardugo wants to set up for the second book, she could set up without the whole back third of this novel. Um, and pacing lags in the back third, it becomes very slow. I read the story really quickly. I didn't have a lot of trouble reading it, but I do remember in the back third being like, okay, where are we going? This story is starting to flounder. I feel like all the, all the mystery, all the questions I had have been answered. I don't have anything else that I want to know. And, you know, the, sup the surprises at the end, because I didn't want to know them, so it was all surprise to me, didn't, didn't feel good. I didn't like them, they didn't leave me on a high, and it didn't make Alex a more competent or better character because she faced and defeated those foes. I would have rathered her and the ghost she's working with continue to develop a partnership and a relationship. I would have liked if discovering who had killed his wife, if we had continued that story into the second book, and maybe where she is in. We would have had to figure out another place for her to be because she was connected to the female guidance counselor. Um, so that all wraps up at the end. But I didn't think that was satisfying or good. So we can just continue that mystery into the second book, continue her research, and maybe it would have been better if she was in the same plane as Darlington for her own various reasons, or maybe a demon or some such had spirited her spirit away. You know, there's a lot of things that could have happened. If she had been used for any kind of ritual purpose at all, and then they were holding her spirit in a hell dimension with Darlington, then we could be going after Darlington and we could be going after the bridegroom, bridegroom's wife together. And I think that would have been a more interesting team up. That team up is particularly interesting because Alex is so afraid of ghosts. and she does end up working with this ghost. Like, we could have continued that dynamic. It was a cool dynamic. I liked it. So to summarize, I think Ninth House was an excellent book. I thought the writing was really well done. The level of description, the details provided, the thought put into the magical system, how it worked, and um, Alex's place in that system, a little bit of ongoing mystery with her as to why she has all this power that it doesn't seem like other people have or that they've ever encountered before. All of that was interesting and well done. I thought the character arc for Alex was good. Uh, Darlington was fine. The other characters, excluding uh, the ghost, the bridegroom, were like, okay. 
You know, they served their purpose. They weren't special. So I think this book was great for the most part. Um, a couple of things that, I, just to summarize what I would change, I would have told the story in a linear, linear fashion. I would have found a way to tell it all from Alex's perspective. And those parts that were interesting about Darlington, about how he grew up, I would have found a way for him to communicate that to Alex. Because if the two of them had a conversation about the parts of Darlington's life that were hard, I think Alex would have been able to relate better to Darlington. And then I'd have understood the Darlington-Alex relationship better. So, yeah, linear story, all from Alex's perspective. I'd have gotten rid of the college classes part entirely, just had Alex being an intern and learning how to deal with ghosts and the understanding that eventually she'll be going to Yale. I feel like housing her and giving her a small stipend, especially since they have all this free housing, would have been cheaper than sending her to Yale anyway. So just go ahead, house her, feed her, give her a small stipend, and call it a job instead of having her go to class, which would have gotten rid of some of the, th the college hot button issues. I would have had more people of color involved in the cast, just, you know, Make everyone not white, except for Alex. Make a couple people also minorities. And I would have completely overhauled the back third of the story. Um, I still would have had the follow-up, the setup for the sequel being that Alex is going to find Darlington. And I would have continued the bridegroom and Alex's dynamic into the second book with him searching for his wife. And I would have found some other purpose for his, for his wife than the one that we got. Overall, the story was really well done. Um, but those are my suggestions on how I would have workshopped it and changed it. I am going to be reading the second in the series when it comes out. I don't know if I'll like it as much as the first series. I don't think the premise is as strong. No. Um, I think what works in this first book so well is the mystery. Now that I know so much about the world, I don't know if I'll be pulled in. But I am excited to find out, so I'll be reading the second book. But thanks for sticking with me. Tell me what you think. Did you like The Ninth House? And if you didn't like it, tell me why. Or if you did like it, tell me why. Do you like the changes I'd make? Are there other changes you would make? And is there anything I missed or any core element you think I should have touched on that I skipped over? Overall, thanks for watching. If you want more content like this, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Give me a like if you liked this, and please leave me a comment. Tell me about, tell me in detail more about what you want or what you want or what you'd like less of. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!